Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. On a recent episode, we talked about pyramids through a chapter from Anthony Norvell, but it inspired me to look further into the subject of pyramids. Pyramids completely fascinate me, both in the mystery and in the science. In the Law of One material, Ra explains they played a part in the building of the Great Pyramid and that all pyramids can be used for energy and there's an implication that the pyramid itself can create an altered state of consciousness. I have the meditation which I really love where I take you to the middle of the galaxy to a gigantic pyramid and just imagining pyramids for some people can be an incredibly powerful technique. I talked on that episode about putting a pyramid under my bed, little tiny one, and what exactly is happening with the pyramid? Why is it working in that particular way? And there has been a lot of research on the pyramid. It's interesting, in Russia, they started to experiment with different angles. A lot of the early research relied entirely on the exact angles of the Great Pyramid and there has been a lot of information on how it heals. There is a video from Sadhguru, I think he mentions, it's really only just for keeping something from aging. It has a preservation type quality, like in a really advanced refrigeration system. But I believe that it is more than that. Although research has shown that with these pyramids, amazing things can happen. There's an old, obscure, out-of-print book I found written by Bill Shul and Ed Pettit called The Secret Power of Pyramids that discusses pyramids and altered states of consciousness, which I found super fascinating. In their discussion of pyramids, they begin by saying, No other man-made object has claimed man's attention and wonderment as the Great Pyramid at Giza, the largest, heaviest, oldest, and most perfect structure created by human hands continues to overwhelm the imagination, to defy explanation, and to mystify its examiners. So ancient that its origin becomes lost in the shadows of time, it continues to offer up ever new knowledge of man and his environment. Curiously enough, as man's body of scientific knowledge grows, the Great Pyramid, like an embodied and immortal oracle, appears to anticipate the answers. Perhaps it is this encoded and seemingly unending storehouse of wisdom, ever unfolding to those wise centuries for the Great Pyramid, a central position in man's search for the hows and whys of his existence. And perhaps it is not too poetic to imagine that hidden somewhere in its history, its mathematical perfection, its purpose for being are man's long sought answers to his own destiny. Surely then, the Great Pyramid would be the Philosopher's Stone. But while the Great Pyramid was confounding experimentation and tantalizing its investigators to construct better technologies, it charitably offered up one of its many secrets. Its shape alone conjured up known and unknown forms of energy affecting both animate and inanimate objects. No sooner had the discovery been made by the Frenchman M. Bovis that structures built to the exact ratio of the Great Pyramid and placed in the same manner on the north-south magnetic axis would mummify meat, preserve food, sharpen razor blades, etc. Then a whole new set of questions was launched concerning the nature of unexplained energy fields to say nothing of the fresh wonderment about the pyramid itself. Bovis's discovery and the follow-up work by Czechoslovakian radio engineer Carol Derbal were reported in Psychic Discoveries Behind the Iron Curtain by Ostrander and Schroeder. The book, which has claimed a tremendous following in this country and abroad, set loose a stampede of basement tinkerers and toolshed experimenters along with professional researchers. Discussion groups and experimental research clubs sprang up around the country to share findings and ideas on the subject. Several newsletters were established and widely circulated. In the three years since the adventure was launched, some very interesting and thought-provoking results have emerged. The effects on persons sitting, sleeping, meditating in pyramid structures 
have some implications to the fields of physiology, psychology, and metaphysics. Shortened healing time, relief from headaches, better relaxation, weight loss for overweight people, rejuvenation, etc. should say something to the medical profession. Results from meditating within the pyramid and heightened psychic sensitivity should interest the metaphysician and those interested in transcendental states. The effects on plant growth and seed germination should arouse the interest of the horticulturist, and food and water purification and preservation should claim the attention of every concerned person. The new adventures with pyramids offer exciting possibilities to persons from all walks of life. The research scientist and the home workshop buff, the philosophical discourser and the physics student looking for a project. The results of this involvement, however, may have some significance in our constant search for a greater understanding of ourselves and our environment. And the book goes on to discuss a variety of wonderful examples, both scientifically and anecdotally, about healing, the pyramid's effect on solids, on plant growth, and it's a very robust discussion about the science around this if you're looking for that. And they also have a chapter on the voice of the pyramid, but I really enjoyed the chapter on the pyramid and altered states of consciousness. Shul begins by saying, stillness built ominous walls around me. I was cut off separated from reality checks, and I touched my face, my legs, the floor on which I sat, to orient myself in space. It retreated and came back to press upon me. The stillness grew, became heavier, and finally shouted at me from its anti-sound existence. I listened. My whole being became the verb listen, and then I wasn't. How long I sat there, curled yoga style in the darkness, I do not know. All was suspended, but from somewhere there slipped in a fragment of time and some small rent in space and I was again. It was me. I knew that remembered that I constructed me again. Me on a concrete floor, inside a plastic pyramid, inside a wooden building, inside a garden, inside a universe, car passed in the street outside and not too distant, two dogs informed one another of certain territorial rights. I collected reality items from outside, the car, and then another, the dogs, gusts of wind, breathing heavily through the leaves of the elms. Once collected, I found I could release the items and settle within myself again. The stillness came back, but this time to share rather than demand, and a great permeating sense of contentment seemed to envelope me. I was and would remain no other source for the peacefulness than this. After a while, I became aware that I had moved. I was standing, and directly in front of me, my feet touching the base, was the Great Pyramid of Giza. This realization did not seem strange to me, but I was nearly overcome. However, by the immensity of the mountain, I stood in awe for some time, looking up at its apex. Quite suddenly, I was inside the pyramid. It was not a room or passageway in which I found myself, and yet I did not seem encased in stone. And while definitely within the structure, I could still look up and see the apex. Just as quickly, that scene changed and I was inside the king's chamber. I went forward to the stone sarcophagus and lay down within it. Seemingly as a matter of course, closed my eyes and breathed deeply and waited. Without opening my eyes, I became aware that there were several entities in attendance. They were sending silent messages to me. I lifted out of my body and hovered about the chamber and saw my body in the coffer, but was disinterested in it. I seemed to be moving out of the chamber and toward another section of the pyramid. But just as suddenly as before, the scene changed. It was no longer the Great Pyramid. It was a nine-foot plastic model. This metamorphosis startled me. The other had seemed so real. I struggled for several minutes with my disappointment as I was planning on spending the night inside the pyramid. I lay down on the cot, yet I could not sleep as I tried to understand what had happened to me. Clearly, I had not been asleep and dreaming for the physical signs of entering and coming out of sleep were not present. I was equally sure it had not been a matter of fantasizing for I had not gone through the usual mental constructs. 
I'd been meditating at the time, and the most plausible explanation seemed to be an experience of mental projection. It was an out-of-body experience. It was as real on one level as on actual physical experience. Paul Brunton's account of his night alone in the Great Pyramid kept coming back to me. In the early 1930s, writer-philosopher Dr. Paul Brunton was granted the highly unprecedented privilege of spending the night inside the pyramid. He tells of the experience in a search in secret Egypt. As far as is known, no one had stayed overnight in the pyramid for a hundred years, nor has anyone since Brunton. He was told that it was not allowed and only gained permission after great persistence. It is a commonly held belief of the natives of the area, as well as many others, that the pyramid is haunted. Strange tales have been told through the ages of beings who come alive at night and stalk the passageways. Those daring to stay after sunset invite the curse of the pharaohs, and if they should by chance live through the ordeal, they would be hopelessly insane. It is the custom to lock the iron gate of the entrance at the sundown, and Brunton was told that no exception could be made. Once inside, he was virtually a prisoner during the hours of darkness. He moved through the narrow passageways confronted by large bats and looming unexpected shadows of himself cast by flashlight beam. He arrived in the king's chamber, sat down beside the coffin-like sarcophagus, turned off the light and waited. He achieved a passive receptive state of mind and determined to hold the contemplative state throughout the long night. The atmosphere of the room became very real to him and the feeling grew that he was not alone that something animate and living was throbbing into existence. Quickly I found that in the sensing of invisible life around me rapidly rose into complete certainty. Brunton struggled with his feelings of fear and the nameless dread that flickered into his heart and tried to maintain his meditative position on the floor. Shadows began to flit and fro in the shadowless room. Gradually these took more definite shape and the malevolent countenances appeared suddenly quite close to my own face. Sinister images rose plainly before the mind's eye. Then a dark apparition advanced, looked at me with fixed, sinister regard, and raised its hands in a gesture of menace, as though seeking to inspire me with awe. Every effort seemed to be made to drive him from his vigil. At last the climax came. Monstrous elemental creations, evil horrors of the underworld, forms of grotesque insane, uncouth, and fiendish aspect gathered around me and afflicted me with unimaginable repulsion. In a few minutes, I lived through something which will leave a remembered record behind for all time. That incredible scene remains vividly photographed upon my memory. But the end came with startling suddenness. All became quiet within the stone vault. Then a new presence made itself known. The atmosphere changed from one of foreboding and evil to one of pureness and sanity. Brunton experienced the entrance of a friendly and benevolent being and then another. They approached him and were seen as tall, white-robed figures. Indeed, they looked more than men, bearing the bright mien of demigods, for their faces were set in unique cloistral calm. After he was observed for some time, Brunton was told that he should not have come that he should follow the path appointed for mortal feet. When he stated that he had to follow the path he had chosen and could not be persuaded to leave, the being whom he likened to an Egyptian high priest spoke to him, So be it. Thou hast chosen. Abide by thy choice, for there is now no recall. Farewell. When the first figure was gone, the second figure moved closer. My son, he said, the mighty lords of the secret powers have taken thee into their hands. Thou art to be led into the hall of learning tonight. He was told to stretch out upon the stone sarcophagus. His body became numb as an iciness passed from his feet throughout his body. When all awareness seemed to rest in the head, he seemed to be caught up in a whirlwind and passing upward through a narrow hole. I leapt into the unknown. I was free. Out of his body, a phantom showing up the wall stones in a soft moonbeam-like light Brunton was then allegedly taken to other parts of the pyramid where he was instructed by his host. While fragments of the teachings were offered the reader, no one has the distinct impression that there were many secret insights that Brunton either chose not to divulge or was instructed. 
reading Brunton's later books, particularly the wisdom of the overself, one cannot help but be stirred by the profundity of his message. One wonders then if the message of this strange night are being offered, Brunton never says, yet one of the instructions given him, which he does share, may in a very real way sum up all instructions. The mystery of the Great Pyramid is the mystery of thine own self. The secret chambers and the ancient records are all contained in thine own nature. Sitting there in my own small darkness, the setting much less romantic than Brunton's, I kept telling myself that I was harboring some grandiose hallucination, that it was dramatic of me to compare in any manner my experience with this. But there it was. I could not erase the vividness of what to me had seemed utterly real at the time it was being experienced. I too had gone within myself, and where, I asked, does any experience occur but within oneself? Brunton's experience did not occur to the stone, but within himself. Could mine be denied because it happened at another place on earth and within a structure of different materials? In the gloomy vault directly above the king's chamber in the Great Pyramid, one man in recent history actually lived. Captain G.B. Caviglia was a man of mystery. In the 1830s, Caviglia saw the pyramids on the Giza plain and became enamored of their mystique. Master of a Maltese merchant vessel, he gave up the sea and the Great Pyramid became his new mistress. He cleaned out the bat excrement from Davison's chamber, named after Nathaniel Davison who discovered the room around 1765 and set up housekeeping in the three-foot-high room. Alexander William Crawford, Lord Lindsay, who knew Caviglia in Cairo, described the Italian as deeply religious, but a very strange man. Crawford wrote, Caviglia told me that he had pushed his studies in magic, animal magnetism, etc. to an extent which nearly killed him, to the very verge, he said, of what is forbidden man to know, and it was only the purity of his intentions which saved him. Crawford offers no further elaboration on this, and Caviglia, who died years later in Paris, left no written record of his experiences. One other encounter with the mind-altering properties of the king's chamber should be mentioned. It was brief, but it may have altered history. So great was its impact on the mind of man who held for a time control of several nations. In 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte conquered Egypt. He visited the Great Pyramid and upon entering the king's chamber, asked to be left alone for a time. Peter Tompkins tells of the incident in Secrets of the Great Pyramid. Coming out, the general is said to have been very pale and impressed. When an aide asked him in a jocular tone if he had witnessed anything mysterious, Bonaparte replied abruptly that he had no comment. Adding in a gentler voice, he would never have wanted the incident mentioned again. Many years later, when he was emperor, Napoleon continued to refuse to speak of this strange occurrence in the pyramid, merely hinting that he had received some presage of his destiny. At St. Helena, just before the end, he seems to have been on the point of confiding to Las Casas, but instead shook his head saying, no, what's the use? You'd never believe me. There are other strange tales to be told of experiences within the Great Pyramid, but of greater significance to most of us are the personal accounts of those who have experienced something different or unusual within the space of pyramid replicas. These experiences are to be easily obtained by anyone willing to build or borrow a large enough pyramid to sit, stand, or lie down in. These experiences, of course, will be of a subjective nature. Endeavoring to unravel their source, it can be said that the observer is imagining, fantasizing, hallucinating, fabricating the experience. True, and the same can be said for Brunton's experience, or for that matter, any personal experience. We can become deeply involved in philosophical discourses on the nature of reality and non-ordinary realities. But, in the final analysis, those experiences to which we give the greatest credence are those that we share in some fashion with others. We are not devoid of these commonly shared experiences when we turn to the reports of those who have spent brief and extended periods within pyramid models. We have visited with a number of these individuals and discovered that the experiences were related without their having any previous knowledge of the experience of others. A number of persons who had no acquaintance with pyramids were asked to meditate or just sit for a time inside a pyramid 
and to tell us what they felt or thought afterwards. The common denominator were feelings of solitude, peace, and greater detachment from the world and less concern over physical matters. Because of these feelings, those familiar with meditation stated they felt less distracted, more removed, and could more easily center within themselves. While there were those who said they felt no difference inside than outside the pyramid, they were the exceptions. Most experienced something if it was nothing more than a sense of calmness or mild euphoria. Relaxation was a commonly reported phenomena, as were feelings of renewed energy or being charged. When I meditated inside the pyramid, I felt a weight or force being moved through my body, starting at the top of the head and moving down through the shoulders, the body and into the legs, Carl Waldron told us. The next day there was a particular clearness of thought, much more energy and an ability to know and understand. There was a keen awareness of a strong heartbeat and seemingly a movement inside. My head seemed to be pulled toward the apex and there was a desire to place my hands together in a prayer pose, Laura Lee Camp said. Anne May Ingram, unaware of Camp's reaction, told us the first impression was peaceful silence. After some minutes, there seemed to be a heavy pressure around me, holding or pushing me deep into the chair. There seemed to be an enlargement of the heart and I was aware of my heart. There was a power of some kind going to the heart and coming from the heart. The entire body seemed to take on a vibration, a tingle, as if one had been holding onto a machine that was vibrating very fast. Movie actress Gloria Swanson has stated that she feels a tingling when she sleeps with a small pyramid beneath her bed. In Pyramid Power, Max Toth and Greg Nielsen state, Another interesting observation made by many of the participants in these experiments was when they raised their hands into the apex, they experienced a prickling sensation as if tiny needles were being stuck into the extremity. The tingling sensations are reminiscent of statements made by persons subjected to the energy force of the multi-wave oscillator or the Reich organ accumulator. Occasionally, one hears of someone making a similar comment about acupuncture. Regarding reports of unusual sensations in the heart, Toth and Nielsen comment, allegedly the most beneficent energies inside the pyramid are focused within the so-called heart center. This is the spot which is probably the safest for the incubation of thought forms. However, it has been suggested that different thought forms might best be incubated at different spots in order for the person inside the pyramid to receive the energy most advantageous in fulfilling the specific thought form. Persons using pyramid structures in which to meditate on a regular basis have claimed they experience serenity and an integration with cosmic forces. Several have reported they have received spiritual impressions while inside the pyramid and upon leaving, psychic perceptions seem to flood their consciousness. Tenny Hale, an Oregon psychic sensitive, claims that during heightened awareness brought on by a seven-day fast and intense meditation, she was instructed to use a pyramid for achieving beneficial altered states of consciousness and to improve her already existing powers of extrasensory perception. Upon leaving her pyramids following meditation exercises, she claims that psychic impressions fill her mind. On one occasion, she went to her typewriter and typed 100 different prophecies. According to newspaper and magazine reports, Mrs. Hale has been accurate on a number of psychic revelations. Two psychic researchers lived for a time in a large wooden pyramid in Florida. Reverend Ron Osterboro and Mrs. Rose Stevens subsisted mainly on fruit juices and spent a great deal of time in meditation. After a month, the couple reported receiving messages on physical cures, the origin and purpose of man, and information of a prophetic nature. For the past year, I have slept two nights a week in one of our pyramids. I sincerely believe that this experience has contributed to my good health and an increase in energy. I look forward to sleeping in the pyramid because of the serenity and peaceful solitude I have found there. It is very difficult to maintain a state of tension while inside the pyramid and this feeling of greater ease has been increasingly extended throughout the day. Dreaming, of course, is one state of awareness, and I have noticed that in recent months my dreams have become clearer and more vivid. A number have taken on qualities of reality of the normal waking state. Recently, a dream in which a small baby was laughing seemed to unfold a panorama of man's evolution. The laughing infant 
appeared to be a graphic way of illustrating the nature of man's sojourn on this planet. The baby was quite an old soul but had appeared once again in the form of a child. On another occasion while lying on the cot in the pyramid in the twilight zone between sleep and wakefulness, I saw a wide white ribbon of road lined with stately trees winding through lush farmland. I seemed to be driving some sort of blue and white vehicle. I pulled into what I knew to be the sanitation department's garbage and refuse area, but it was beautifully landscaped, approximately one half mile wide and one mile long. In front of me were eight gleaming pyramids, each painted a different color of distinct pastel. I seemed to know that the pyramids were around 250 feet tall and with bases 375 foot square. Narrower roads branched off the main road and served as access routes to the pyramids. Each of the roads were of colored concrete matching the hue of the pyramid to which they led. The pyramid in use at this time was number three counting from the east. I turned onto the salmon colored road and drove toward the pyramid of that color. I could smell the delightful scent of growing plants and flowers lining the road where there was no unpleasant odor of garbage. I backed the vehicle to the base of the pyramid and dumped my load into an extended conveyor belt which carried the refuse into the pyramid. Refuse was piled in a 160 foot square within the pyramid and would remain there for seven weeks to be dehydrated and cleansed of harmful bacteria. It would then be carried by an underground conveyor belt system to nearby plants for final processing where various materials would be separated, some for building uses, some for use in road construction, and the organic matter for fertilizer. The vision was very real to me and I could still see it in some detail. My experience of vivid visual imagery apparently is not uncommon to those who have spent any time at all inside pyramids. They've reported increased memory recall and allegedly views of past incarnations. Inez Pettit has spent considerable time inside a pyramid relaxing on a chaise lounge for one or two hours at a time. There she seems to pass into a half sleep state still conscious of the world about her while the subjective world within takes on its own reality. One of these occasions she found herself floating above a large city. It was beautifully planned, she said, and it seemed to glow in a rainbow light. On each of the four sides of the city were huge pyramids of polished stone. The capstones of the pyramids appeared to be of crystal from which came a soft but brilliant glow. She said she knew the pyramids served to produce the energy power for the city people of the city wore long robes of kaftan type, and the men in solids and stripes and the women in flowered robes. They appeared quite tall from 10 to 15 feet. All seemed particularly alive, cheerful, and laughing. I could see no ground level vehicles. Instead, there were wide moving walks crisscrossing throughout the city. The walks were green in color and soft to the feet like grass. They moved slowly, so that the people could enjoy the scenery and there were quite a large number of gardens about the size of city blocks. Moving walks had stone benches at intervals. I could hear the conversations, which was typical of most groups today, talk of children, homes, different interests and pursuits. I heard one woman remark to another that this was her birthday. She was not too happy at being middle-aged at 492 years. The other woman remarked, just wait until you reach 900 or so, then you can start feeling old. The houses were all the same size, looking like square cubicles built of some kind of translucent material. There were buildings other than houses, none of them very tall, not more than three or four stories. I went into one of the houses. All I saw was one huge room with stone, upholstered couches and benches. One wall of the room was definitely entertainment and communication center. When they wanted to see what we call movies, they would somehow cause the whole wall to go opaque and the entertainment would start. Or if they wanted to communicate with someone, the person would appear on the wall and talk with them. I really don't know how they accomplished these things. I didn't see any buttons or knobs to push or turn. Perhaps they just mentally willed these activities into existence. It kept worrying me that no one seemed to be working. Some of the buildings must have been hobby centers for arts and crafts. Another thing I saw, no washers or dryers or any type of washroom, no kitchens, baths, or tables and chairs or anything like that. I saw no one eating anything. They were all perfectly clean and their clothing was immaculate. There were all sorts of questions in my mind, to which there seemed no answers. There was a form of vehicle traffic for the city, 
all of it in the air, tear-shaped translucent ships that darted about above the city with incredible speed. When they landed, they came straight down and sat on the roofs. The ship seemed to have no visible means of locomotion and made no sound. It seemed that when they were in the city, they automatically received energy from the pyramids. However, there were times when they needed to replenish the power. This was when they wanted to travel to another city or out into space. Then the ships would hover above one of the pyramids at the apex for a relatively short period of time to acquire the extra power for their journey. The time of recharging depended on the distance they were to travel. After seeing several of the ships leaving the pyramid power zones and dart out into space, I slowly came out of my half-sleep. The vision was particularly clear, and I feel certain that I will remember it for a long time. But though I have returned to the pyramid many times since I have had other interesting experiences, I have never returned to the Rainbow City. As regards dreams, it is interesting to note that Mark Lenner, in an article, Egypt Reflections on a Tour, written for a recent issue of the R Journal, tells of visiting with a very old Arab guide who told him that he had gone many times to a hole in the head of the Sphinx to dream. When Lenner asked him what he dreamed about, the guide replied, I dreamt about the old people. The old people, Lenner asked, what do you see them doing? Running about, working, building, and he imitated persons working with a hammer and chisel. The Sphinx is the best place for dreams. People have reported that a daily dose of pyramid power improves concentration. It apparently worked in one case at least. A college student of our acquaintance was having difficulty concentrating on his studies. We made a pyramid for his bedroom large enough for him to sit in. He started meditating in it each evening and told us that his grades had vastly improved. The student, Dave Wilcox, said he had found new security and confidence in himself. There is great harmony inside the pyramid, he said. I feel a oneness and closeness with the source. My yoga teacher has tried meditating in the pyramid and gets high in a very short period of time. The National Enquirer, January 13, 1974, quoted Hollywood star James Coburn, I firmly believe in pyramid power. I crawl inside my pyramid tent, sit in a yoga position, and it does its work. It gives off a definite feeling and sensation. It creates an atmosphere that makes it easier to meditate. It closes out all interferences. I meditate in there every day between 15 minutes to an hour. Pyramid hats worn to obtain altered states of consciousness have been suggested by Carol Durbal. Durbal was the Czechoslovakian radio engineer who launched the new Pyramidia when his research with pyramid models was discussed in the Schroeder and Ostrander bestseller Psychic Discoveries Behind the Iron Curtain. Durbal wondered why the hats of sorcerers and witches were cone-shaped, and he tried to view experiments with pyramid-shaped hats. Several of his subjects reported feeling an influx of spiraling energy coming down from the top of the hat. Apparently, Durbal was quoted as saying, the pyramid acts like a kind of cosmic antenna, tuning into sources of energy of vaster intensity and then focusing it into its center. Toth and Nielsen suggest the ancient Egyptian priests may have worn their pyramid-shaped hats when worshipping their sun god Ra, because the hats may have focused electromagnetic energy from the sun or from some higher metaphysical plane. Such a possibility is also suggested by Jay Furlong in Rivers of Life. Perhaps the old practice of putting a dunce hat on a student who wasn't shaping up too well wasn't so much a matter of holding him out to ridicule as it was to send him some mental energy. We might hypothesize that the practice was viewed as a means of helping the child to get back into focus, recentered to concentrate, realigned with the source. Jane Roberts, author of the Seth series, doesn't use a dunce hat of physical materials, but she writes that under certain conditions, I got the feeling that a cone came down just over my head. I didn't think that an actual physical cone was there, but the idea of a shape was definite. The wide end was about the size of my head, with the narrow part on top like a pyramid. The ESP Laboratory Los Angeles has been conducting experiments with the pyramid shape being used as an incubator for thought forms. It is hypothesized that the pyramid forms serves as a geometric amplifier which strengthens the request or desire of the individual making the thought form. According to the laboratory's director, Al Manning, a small pyramid is used with triangular pieces of paper. The paper sheets are of four colors, yellow for intuition, orange for mental clarity, blue for healing, and green for love. 
The experimenter chooses one of the colors appropriate for his designs and writes on the triangular sheet a specific request or goal. The paper is then held between the hands while a chant, one's own or one given by the organization, is repeated twice. The apex is then folded down to the base and the bottom folded over to make a triangle. The hands are then held above the triangle and the chant repeated again. This last step should be done with the paper lying on the base of the pyramid. The pyramid is then placed back on its base, always aligned on the north-south axis. And the incubation period has begun. Manning suggests that it takes between three and nine days for the thought form to complete its gestation period. During this period of time, the process is strengthened by chanting and holding the thought form mentally. One should focus on the thought form through the north side of the pyramid once a day, Manning states. The experimenter removes the pyramid from its base and takes out the triangular sheet of paper when he feels that the incubation period has been completed. The paper is unfolded, a lower corner of the paper is grasped, and the triangle is set on fire. The completely devoured ashes are placed in a fireproof receptacle kept at hand during the proceedings. It is believed that the procedure of burning the paper is for the purpose of releasing the thought form in order that it may accomplish its mission. Once the thought form is liberated, the experimenter awaits the results believing that the fire has released a fully charged thought form that will become manifest. The exercise sounds magical and bizarre, but members of the organization throughout the world claim that their requests have been fulfilled. The ESP laboratory has constructed several large pyramids to research the effects of pyramid energy on energy centers in the human body. They draw parallels between the locations of energy centers in the pyramid structure and those in the body. Their research would indicate that the energy in the higher parts of the pyramid is of a higher frequency, whereas the lower regions produce a warm and somewhat soothing feeling. These experimenters have reported that there are some spots within the pyramids that are not beneficial that sitting or lying at particular spots may cause headaches. Apparently, such experiences have been recorded by persons unaware of the reactions of other experimenters. Talk of good spots and bad spots reminds one of Carlos Castaneda's counsel by Don Juan. He is told that there are places of personal power, an individual's own special piece of earth, where he can be strong and immune. Then there are other spots that can destroy. Animals seem to be aware of these special places. They search until they find them and return again and again. Regardless of how much one tries, for example, to make a dog comfortable, if the place is not right, he will not rest there. He will drag the bedding or whatever to a different spot. Our experiments with plants would seem to indicate that all locations within the pyramid are not equal, and we have found that subjects asked to relax or meditate within a pyramid will usually shift around somewhat until they feel comfortable. It would seem that the atmosphere or field within the pyramid is more intense than on the outside. When the spot is right, it is more pleasurable, calming, and enhancing than one might experience otherwise. But when it is wrong, it is really wrong. We have been told there are special energy vortices on earth, that these were known and used by ancients. Some were healing places, some holy places. One wonders then if a device or structure so designed as to gather or amplify these special energy fields wouldn't create a miniature universe within themselves. If so, perhaps the pyramids are offering us more answers than we have thus far suspected. That concludes that particular chapter, and there's so much more to discuss from this book, so I highly recommend it if you're interested in pyramids. I'm also excited, once I receive it, it was a very obscure copy, but I found that U.S. Anderson, who also wrote Three Magic Words, has a book about the secret power of the pyramids, so we will definitely be checking that out as well as we continue on with our research from U.S. Anderson. But the pyramid is just fascinating. And the fact that we have so many pyramids around the planet, we have ones in the poles under the ice and snow. We have found ones in the ocean and they all align certain energy grids around the planet. And they also align energy grids around your body. I have fairly hand-sized pyramid that I'll just rest on the top of my head. I've done it for episodes too. And I can feel particularly my third eye and the plat area somewhere outside of my lower back 
totally light up when I do that. I would love to know what you've experienced. The best thing I can say is to document your personal experiences. Science will not answer these questions completely because we're talking about consciousness. Yes, it can do things like rejuvenate you and it is very helpful in preserving some items. That's why they would bury their dead in these areas. But there's more than preservation. There is a certain channeling of different energies that differentiate into different forms that are consistent with the energy centers of your body. Imagining the pyramid was what I was trying to do with my pyramid meditation. Just imagining it, even though you're not in it, may be enough. But there obviously is some benefits and power to this. And the only way we can discover it is by experimentation. As a consciousness explorer, you can do this. Please put your results in the comments. I want to know more, particularly your experience in altering states of consciousness while you're in the pyramid or using even tiny pyramids. The more people that talk about it, the more this stuff can be accepted because how can we really study this? But we can study it subjectively and that's what we're trying to do. So it is important to go and gather information and this is subjective research as well. And there is certainly a need to gather more information because there may be something here that's pretty amazing and powerful. In any case, you can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution.